Hi everyone, this is part two of the constructive dismissal videos which we've been recording. Uh, for those who watched part one and came back, I'm extremely grateful. For those who are only watching part two, um, as long as you understand the duty of uh, trust and confidence and uh, implied duties, uh, you'll get this, it's okay. Um, so in the first video we discussed the implied term of mutual trust and confidence um, which applies to every employment contract. So that's the requirement that the employer must not, without reasonable and proper cause, conduct itself in a manner calculated and likely to destroy or seriously damage the relationship of trust and confidence between employer and employee. That is a mutual duty as well, but for the purposes of these videos, we're just focusing on the conduct of the employer. Um, so we explored that duty in greater detail in the first video. What I wanted to move on to in this is um, circumstances in which the employer may be liable. So the most obvious uh, liability uh, that, that may arise is where the employer itself, so a, a, an owner or senior director, um, makes certain decisions which amount to a fundamental breach, such as demoting the employee or uh, acting in a way which amounts to bullying, harassment or discrimination. Um, but what happens where the constructive dismissal claim is based on the behaviour of a fellow employee? Um, so even if that employee may not be in a particularly um, serious position and what is the test uh, as to whether the employer is all vicariously liable for the conduct of the employee. Um, so in the case of Hilton, uh, an employee resigned from her job as a telephone supervisor because she was severely reprimanded by her immediate superior in front of other employees. Uh, she said that that treatment was so serious that it amounted to a fundamental um, breach of trust and confidence. Uh, she resigned and claimed that she'd been constructively dismissed. The tribunal upheld the claim and said that the officious and insensitive reprimand had been unjustified, the employee had been humiliated, intimidated and degraded. To such an extent, there was a breach of trust and confidence that went to the root of the contract. So behaviour so serious that it allowed the employee to take free from the contract and bring a claim. At the Employment Appeals Tribunal, the uh, employer argued that the supervisor did not have authority to dismiss. So essentially, because the individual who subjected the victim to this behaviour was not of sufficient um, seniority, uh, the employer should not be vicariously liable for the conduct of its employees in that respect. Um, now, the EAT uh, disagreed. They said that a constructive dismissal requires an act or behaviour that the law re regards as the conduct of the employer. Um, whether that conduct of a supervisory employee binds the employer is governed by the general law of contract. The relevant principle is that an employer is liable for acts done by employees in the course of their employment. So an employer is going to be bound by the actions of its employees if the employee was doing what they were employed to do. So in this case, the supervisor was supervising uh, the, um, the claimant in the case. But in doing so, the employee behaved in a way that if done by the employer would constitute a fundamental breach of contract between employer and employee. There was no basis for drawing the line in, in, um, in the sand in terms of whether the uh, individual committing the, uh, the act of, um, uh, that amounted to a fundamental breach had the authority to dismiss or not. As long as that supervisor was acting within the course of their employment when behaving as they did, uh, the general test um, will be applied to the employer as if they were committing that behaviour themselves. So unfortunately for employers, um, uh, you have uh, quite the job to do in controlling employees in terms of their behaviour and if they get it wrong, uh, you as the employer could be vicariously liable um, for those actions. Um, what about third parties? So individuals who are not actually employed by the business but may commit acts which uh, could amount to a fundamental breach of contract. Um, so liability can arise in two ways here. One, third party conduct for which the employer is deemed to be responsible. Uh, the other, um, where the employer fails to protect the employee. Um, now there is no single test to determine whether an employer is responsible for acts of a third party, but through case law, we know that the following factors are uh, relevant. Was this third party paid remuneration um, for being in the presence of the employee? Um, was, any, was any act done for the benefit of the employer? Was the act complained of incidental to the duties given to the wrongdoer, to the third party? Um, was this um, individual in a position of control? Um, could the employer stop the activity which led to the, um, the claim? Uh, what was done or expressly or impliedly authorised by the employer? Um, was the activity unauthorised? 
um, and was the uh, wrongdoer forbidden um, from behaving in a certain way yet chose to do so um, themselves. Now in one case the Employment Appeals Tribunal upheld the decision that an employee had been constructively dismissed when she resigned in response to conduct from a managing director's husband. Um, so I understand that was fairly aggressive uh, uh, conduct, uh, shouting and, and bullying from somebody who wasn't employed by the business but was the husband of the managing director. However, in a separate case, Mr York, a butcher, who had retired and handed over the family firm to his sons, continued to attend the shop, made weekly visits, gave instructions to the employees, uh, and gave what was uh, deemed by the tribunal to be overly brisk treatment to an employee, which led to her resignation. Um, interestingly, the appeals tribunal in that case held that the company was not responsible for the conduct of this individual coming onto site. It's very difficult to reconcile, really, because they clearly had uh, some control over this individual coming onto site. They could have told him to leave, chose not to do so, yet his behaviour was not deemed to be um, one which created liability for the uh, employer. Now, um, the final element we'll look at is the failure to protect an employee. Uh, and um, this essentially gives an employee another bite at the cherry if they, if they fail to argue that a third party uh, has, um, has created liability for the employer. Now, we we'll return to the case involving the managing director's uh, husband. Uh, the husband was jabbing and shouting uh, at the employee. Uh, irrespective of whether or not the employer was vicariously liable for the acts of the third party, um, there is another implied duty to provide a suitable working environment. And what the employee argued in the alternative in this case was, uh, fair enough, if, um, if the employer isn't responsible for the breach of trust and confidence in relation to the behaviour of the managing director's husband, what they are responsible for is providing a safe working environment, a suitable working environment for me. They failed to do so and there is a breach uh, and the claim would have succeeded in, in that case as well. Um, so this second video unfortunately adds a further headache to employers. Not only have we got implied duties into all contracts that might not be written down that we need to comply with, we also need to be aware that those implied duties can be breached uh, from your own employees, even at fairly junior level, but also potentially by third parties coming onto site. Constructive dismissal is an extremely tricky area. If you do need support in, in managing um, any issues that may arise here, please do get in touch. Visit the website chadwicklawrence.co.uk or um, uh, email employmenthub at chadlaw.co.uk. Thank you.